Fabulous to have a kind of seminar with the students and I'm also here to focus the lecture and so for having now the focus lecture part uh, of the series. And I'm very pleased that Ross Castronovo is joining us here uh, tonight from the University of Wisconsin uh, Madison. And um, Russ kind of entered into my life a long time ago as an Americanist whose work I greatly admire and have uh, learned from. And um, I love the readings of literature that he develops in his work. I love how he's able to work with history uh, in his work in a way that only very few uh, of us, I think, uh, can. Um, it doesn't prevent him from doing theory, which is one of the reasons why I think his work initially uh, spoke to me. Um, it manages to really uh, uh, root itself in historical research, but then also takes its distance from that or work freely with that um, so that in the end you can still arrive at, for example, at the start of this book, a number of propositions which are highly theoretical, which resonates uh, way beyond the actual historical focus uh, of the book uh, and begin to fit into some of the conversations that we, for example, in the studies and politics have last semester in our contemporary political thought class which was not really an American studies class. You know, I know technically my assignment here is to teach American studies, but to be asking the course we work theory also. But uh, the kind of issues, you know, you realize that the kinds of issues we discuss in the class are in a certain sense coming from my understanding also of American studies and a particular historical and political question that inform uh, that field. So, Russ is partly here to celebrate with us um, the publication of his most recent book, American Security and the Origins of Vulnerability. You know, I sent out a chapter from that book, so you know, we talked about one in the seminar uh, today as well. Um, you know, what you're going to be hearing uh, today is related, I think, to the book. Russ is going to speak for about 30, 40 minutes or so, and then we'll have a good chunk of time also to uh, discuss, to ask questions, to enter into conversation as we like to do in the program. Agree with the special disagree, maybe also, with some of what you'll put out there uh, for us. So join me in welcoming Russ Castorno. Can you all for being here? I know it's late on Friday. Um, we don't be shy about getting more nutrient. Uh, during the talk, get up. I think some of the wine will probably help. It have <laughs> uh, it's been great being here. I got to experience another earthquake. Um, and really, it's just a delight to be here to be asked to be here. It's such an important. Um, and really, it's just a delight to be here to be asked to be here. It's such an important um, center for, for the practice of thinking about arts. So you have someone who works on aesthetics and politics and. You know, become kind of part of a program where um, both sides are being equally weighted. It's just a rare treat. And of course, the opportunity, you know, I really didn't know already until just a couple of months ago, we were doing some email back and forth. And just to you know, have that opportunity to be in conversation with him and his you know, pretty dazzling mind is, is it's, it's just a, a rare uh, treat that I don't get enough of. So um, thank you all for, for, doing, for being here. So I'm just going to jump in on this talk today. Called security at the end of the. Well, I left the word out. Oh, oh, should be at the end of the world. <laughs> I, I now realize that. So uh, maybe that will come back. Maybe we need something to word too. So uh, the, the aesthetics of vulnerability. So today, so today, what I'd like to do is tell you a bit about my recent book and um, suggest why we need to think about security as an aesthetic. Matter. Um, you know, know it's a fundamental um, concept of modern and social political organization, not just in terms of policy, but that security is also psychic, um, emotional, affective. Um, and this affective dimension to security, I hope, might be of modest interest to people in an institute for the arts. Um, but rather than just go back over my book, what I'd like to do is take over this, this um, take this up on occasion as an opportunity to try to extend some of the thinking on the topic, especially the connections between vulnerability, a word that comes to us from the Latin, by the way, the word for wounding, and aesthetic experience. It's a connection that is posing some tough questions for me. Maybe you can help me figure them out when you add your own. Is art something that wounds us? What's the relationship between experience, aesthetic experience, and injury? What pitfalls are involved in aestheticizing risk and harm? In as much as we may be on aesthetic grounds, 
Let's start with a visual exercise, a bit of audience participation if we can here. So we have these two slides, and um, I'm curious how you read them. What do you see? This is like really the true audience participation part of this uh, talk. Tell me about these two images. Anything you want to notice that we should start thinking about? I would say um, the picture on the left is um, like there is a there is uh, already a such an, like a palette of colors. It should mm -hmm. be yellow, but uh, yellow and uh, yeah, red. I would say yellow and also black, but more but dark colors of the picture. And so we see this, um, which which looks to be a bag. Uh, right, the back. I would say the backpack. Yeah, yeah. like um, there is. I mean, it's interesting with the text, like if you say, if you see something, say something, because it already implies that, um, um, like, it, it, it directs our um, interpretation of, of this picture as there is something odd, and um, like, like the more, the, 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 I would say, the obvious picture would be that the, the bag is odd, like, okay, but this bag is here without anyone, something that is um, weird. Yeah. What other observations do we have about these pictures? So here we have a bag. Here we got like focus, resolution. Just what do we, what do we just? Yeah. Mm. It looks like it was taken on like an, an old iPhone or something. Like the resolution. One on the left. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the one on the right is a little distorted. Um, but it makes like it implies that it's surveilling your peers and like your community and so this one does that implies to really do like <laughs> the word suspicious really stand out to me i also say that i travel a lot in transit and like so the first thing that strikes me when i see both of these pictures is the sentence see something say something which to me always is they are the big album because it's always in spanish and mm -hmm. as much as english in so the fact that it's just in English, that already oh, it surprises me. I'm looking at it thinking there's something wrong with that, with that image because it's only in one language. But also it's got the thing, the other words that come out with is the word safe, which is there. there's, so there's something, something unattended safe is the kind of word I'm the right hand side, but you follow down from the backpack. Right. Uh, and that's also on uh, LA Transit, the number you call is uh, nine eight 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 nine. Safe, safe. What's that word? Safe. Someone. What kind of culture? I don't really know how you dial safe, but um, that. So and on the right, uh, I can because it's a bit uh, taking out of the right, not doing it. Oh. But suspicious activity. I mean, is that is the person suspicious? I don't know what suspicious activity is. Right. This is, is the, the key thing. On the phone. There's nothing. There's no back. Person who maybe who looks not white. I mean, I don't, I don't know, them, but so basically, I don't know. I can't quite profile them, but but they're yeah, you can't read them. Okay, this is the key thing that you're noticing. So here, it's really clear what we're supposed to be suspicious of, right? This one unattended bag with distinct, almost like you know, kind of very realistic, um, sharp resolution, right? This one, right? Everything that's out of focus, right? Uh, you know, the person on the phone, phone who I assume is reporting suspicious activity in the moment. And I think this is a key development in the kind of the archaeology of security because what we're led to do is like, okay, I'm worried about the backpack, specific focus, right? To this, the whole general society, the society is now uh, is something that we should surveil, right? I think this is an important evolution in a type of security discourse where. We're supposed to be aware, worried about the whole social milieu, it's right? The whole environment. Yeah. It's not a thing. It's suspicious. Right. It's right. Suspicious. And so there's this other person who kind of brought me to these um, images. His name's our guy Emerson, and he reads these images as he says, "quote An unattended bag begins not as a threat, but as an object of perception, just as an individual begins not as vigilant, but as an everyday computer." Unquote. Now, this is, I think, a good observation, but what I think it misses is the fact that the political subject, let's say this person or the person outside the frame, at least since the origin of the social contract of Hobbes and Locke, is always a subject of security. 
that once someone who exercises vigilance to protect their person and property and a biopolitical entity that in turn needs to be watched, their actions and behaviors subject to calculation and prediction. In short, an entity that needs to be secured. You might think of Liam Neeson, I know, um, as the hypothesis of the security subject, right? The everyday commuter whose ordinariness also comprises quiet rage, frustration, and a world weariness that can make violence seem casual. Right? Rage is one of the key, uh, it will be a key term that I'll be coming back to uh, in, in my remarks here. So let's um, dwell a bit more on the previous image of the, on that everyday imperative that confronts us in the security line at the airport or on the subway platform, right? You mentioned it already. If you see something, say something. This side ish often includes a second injunction to, quote, report suspicious activity. Now, sighted people are always seeing something. What would it mean to take this directive at its word and, give, and begin compiling a list of all that we observe at the bus stop or at the station of the metro, shopping bags, vermin, trash, cell phones? The result would be an unending accumulation whose sheer extent dwarfs the significance of one unattended fact. The significance of information is overwhelmed by its ubiquity. The more disruptive, or even more disruptive possibility, is that people might see and report other things. Crumbling roads and bridges, homelessness, signs of environmental devastation and climate change. Seeing something and saying something makes security awareness a constant activity that forcefully reminds us of its impossibility. Our active visual decoding harbors an important methodological point. Security is a matter of aesthetics. Feeling secure is an effective condition, one that is bound up negatively, but also necessarily anxiety, fear, and vulnerability. Instead of a loose synonym for artistic or beautiful, aesthetics more properly signifies a range of bodily sensations and corporeal effects, including the moments when people are overwhelmed by information, when they are struck dumb by shock and awe, when they are paralyzed with fear, when they are stopped in their tracks by an encounter with the sublime, when they seek solidarity to hedge against risk and insecurity. Each moment resounds with the capacity to decenter the subject and breach both the psychic and physical protections that contribute to feelings of security and well-being. When or where these feelings might take it, overtake us is anybody's guess. The importance of probability and predictiveness to security. And for instance, here you can think about the algorithms that provide over social life. All these things jar with the spontaneity and unpredictability inherent to aesthetic experience. So while security is inescapably an affective condition of feeling safe or unsafe, the topic is rarely treated as an aesthetic matter and seldom are art in the humanities thought to contribute to the debates it sparks. Discussions of security tend to be dominated by the field of international relations, studies of policing, and surveillance studies with an emphasis on social science after 9-11. Scholarly approaches to security tend to rely on narrow definitions that limit the terms elasticity to national security, border security, financial security, social security, food security, network security, and so on. What's more, each sector of security is often kept separate from the other. Accepting national security is something distinct from social security. To use Mark Nicolaos' example, fulfills, quote, the desire of the state to keep these things apart, to draw a veil over the unity of state power. This line of argument, however, keeps aesthetics on the sidelines by treating security only as a matter of state power in ways that are unattuned to the feelings that people have about ideas and forms that, while bound up in the state, both precede and exceed it, such as property, privacy, information, and race. To cite a few examples from this book that I've written, the state has long been launched the front and center of security discourse, a, uh, a tendency that favors diplomacy analysis, game theory, and statistical predictions of risk that orient this course around facts and rational assessments, not feelings and affect. So rather than accept this division, the topic of security, how it makes us feel, how it contours, contours ideas of privacy and property, 
how it affects our thinking about whiteness and race, how it so often serves as both the origin and endpoint of political community, cannot be left to policy investigations that fail to take up the full range of emotions from safety to terror. Neither international relations nor the field of critical security studies that emerged at the end of the 20th century is particularly good at asking aesthetic questions. Given the presence of security in every crook and recess of modern life, via regimes of surveillance that have morphed into data valence, political theory by itself seems inadequate for grappling with security. For their part, cultural theorists interested in aesthetics have not asked very good questions about security. Not that literary cook critics like myself, like me, for example, haven't turned their attention to security, but when they do so, the focus has often been limited to the thematics of how ecological terrorists or other crises are represented. One prevailing approach takes shape as an appliqué that reads a novel or analyzes a film as illustration of conclusions that theorists of security, surveillance, and biopolitics have already reached. The military and the police constitute only the most recognizable elements of national security, a credit card fraud, computer hacking, and identity theft signal the fact that the extent to which security has expanded to encompass global financial, epistemological, and even ontological concerns, right? Identity theft. Literary interpretation and limiting itself to representations of policing or state control has claimed not much more than a subordinate role with respect to security discourse. What if, quote, instead of taking literature to reflect a set of problems and mechanisms first articulated in security theory, as Johannes Boltz asked. We took aesthetics as provocation for asking fundamental questions about the project of security that shapes information, health, technology, and media, and just about every facet of modern life. Any answer to this question, I would suggest, needs to grapple with the problem of why security makes us feel so unsafe. And that's kind of a core contradiction that I've been wrestling with. No impetus for security exists without, without an active sense of fear, without acute feeling that subjects, their property, and their persons are vulnerable. The homeowner who imagines burglars breaking through a kitchen window is impelled to install an electronic security system. The investor worried about financial security, market downturns, creates a portfolio that relies on financial security to reduce lists, risk, although recent history has certainly shown that low risk holdings such as mortgage-backed securities, can turn to be high-risk families. The nation put an edge by fears of foreign aggression, heightens military preparedness and weapon security, though, of course, strategies of deterrence increase insecurity for other powers that now feel they must compete in an arms race. National security in this context relies on the apocalyptic capacity to imagine the ultimate insecurity of nuclear war. In each case, security requires imaginings of theft, catastrophic loss, and annihilation. The, or the origin of security is fear. It is no doubt worthwhile mentioning that fearful imaginings can be, fearful imaginings can be well founded and that apprehensions, like paranoia, are frequently grounded in reality. Malware and ransomware are worth taking seriously, just as food security, climate security, and what the UN terms human security demand international attention and global action. Yet in contrast to one expert, this is one security expert, who sees, quote, living in a state of constant fear as the antithesis of security, unquote, I think that fear is better recognized as a necessary precondition of security and what's more, source of its continuing justification. The classical way of understanding this interplay is suggested by Gregoire Shamayus, a theory of the drone, a book brought to my attention by Arne de Boot. In his work on unmanned aerial surveillance and weapon systems, Shemaya recalls the myth of Achilles being dipped in the river Styx by his mother, mother, the scene of Theus. This act guarantees him bodily invulnerability, except for, of course, his heel. I like this um, sculpture I found of it for a couple of reasons. Um, first of all, not that I dip that many babies into liquid, <laughs> but this seems just such an awkward way of exposing the child and making him more vulnerable um, and making sure that the child like, is already like gasping on water. And it's, like, you can also train away from the subject, the 
the fetus or stuff, I think was really interesting. And of course, she's worried about the child, not so much worried about the child vulnerability, but then there's also the vulnerability or the modesty suggested by this the, the sculpture um, in itself. So this, um, you know, this is this, a neoclassical sculpture by Thomas Banks. And what I think it suggests is like how there's a kind of um, mythical immunity here leaves the baby Achilles acutely susceptible to catastrophic wounding. As Shemayu sums up, the waters of the underworld make Achilles' body, quote, vulnerable, and at the same time produces its most vulnerable point. Or as de Boudre puts it, vulnerability, quote, will always inevitably come back to haunt, unquote, the image of sovereign invulnerability. There's an added layer of contradiction, namely that, that, that the fear that stems from vulnerability provides pleasure. In the political theory of sovereignty and in the aesthetic theory of the sublime, there's a recurring topos of a storm-tossed ship where the interplay of vulnerability and security provides pleasure. Here's Hobbes' example, um, one that Schiller will repeat in writing about the sublime. Um, and it's an example of a shipwreck observed from the safety of the shore. What to name the position in which, quote, men take pleasure to behold from the shore the danger of them that are at sea and in the tempest or in a fight, or from a safe castle to behold two armies charge one another in the field? It is certainly, it is certainly in the whole sunk joy. Else men would never flock to such a spectacle. Nevertheless, there is in it both grief and joy. For there, as there is novelty and remembrance of her own security present, which is delight, so is there also pity, which is grief. But the delight is so far predominant that men usually are content in such a case to be spectators of the misery of their friends. So spectacle in this case requires a secure location. Witnesses to the battle in the distance are not caught between warring forces and observers of the doomed boat stand with feet firmly planted on the ground. The important difference is that Hobbes, unlike later peers of the Sublime, makes no room for either release or transcendence, and that is precisely the point. The Leviathan offers no respite from fear, and what's more, political society depends upon its ever-present existence, whether through the putative scepter of the sovereign the dim but ineradicable suspicion of what life in the state of nature would look like without security. Updates to this insight suggest that contemporary neoliberalism, for instance, does not so much offset insecurity, but invites it, and indeed makes it structurally necessary to governance. So if you scratch the surface of people's feelings about the security that the state provides, Hobbes contends, if you do this, and the continual fear that is humanity's true share comes to life. But here's the rub, there would be no art with, with there would be no art without the sphere that seeks us, that impels us to seek safety. Hobbes is explicit on this point. Quote, without other security than in their own strength, unquote, individuals would use all their energy defending their persons from harm and their precious possessions from predation, leaving nothing for the creation of a common culture. Out of fear comes the security without which there, quote, would be no account of time, no arts, no letters, no society, unquote. Too much fear becomes disabling, but knowledge of its existence proves that security is at once a requisite to human flourishing and that it can never be relaxed. Without security, the very force that seeks to predetermine the future, renew continues to make behavior predictable and govern, whether by means of a military, the police, or algorithms. Without all these things, art, by this logic, is impossible because violence and anarchy would press all too closely. It's quite a contradiction. For Hobbes, as Corey Robbins states, quote, fear does not betray the individual. It is his completion. It is not the antithesis of civilization, but its fulfillment, unquote. Hence, the contentment, the joy, and the pleasure and delight that Hobbes discerns in fear. Fear emerges as the mainstay of the social order 
just as awareness of vulnerability provides ongoing and compelling justification for political subjects to strive upon, often against others, for the purposes of security. Vulnerability in the long linguistic history trace, that you can trace back to the Iliad, where the Trojans, in an effort to rally their forces in the face of the Greek onslaught, are encouraged to remember that, quote, the Greeks, like yourselves, are vulnerable flesh. This appeal hinges on the shared status of the human body as imminently permeable, injurable, always at risk. Might we take Homer's statement as an early iteration of the embattled slogan today that all lives matter? Of course, all in this phrasing does some dubious political work by claiming vulnerability on behalf of humanity as a single ontological unit in ways that invalidate more specific and contextual assertions most notably black lives matter. Many have stressed that vulnerability is a common human condition that can serve as a resource for empathy, care, and reinvigorating social coalitions. It's a way of thinking not without some trenchant critiques, as we would do well to remember that vulnerabilities are unequally apportioned across the social landscape and are used to justify the state's guardianship and surveillance over vulnerable populations. Yet, there may be something to hold on to when it comes to vulnerability, not as an identity capital, nor as a source of fraught claims to agency, but as a methodological orientation. What happens to the illusion of self-sovereignty when we encounter aesthetic forms? Feeling vulnerable, we are potentially exposed to multiple readings, including new ways of seeing and making sense of a world that is structured by security. Collisions with the aesthetic help see this attitude of susceptibility to alternative meanings. As Marianne Hirsch suggests, vulnerability prepares, quote, we were just talking about this at the exact moment in the seminar that I had the good uh, fortune of attending, prepares us for, quote, a radical openness towards surprising possibilities that enables creative and imaginative thinking. In contrast, striving for invulnerability requires, quote, a defensiveness that shuts down debate and silences dissent, unquote, effects that are toxic to the cultivation of democratic culture. Quote, vulnerability ought not to be identified exclusively with passivity, writes Judith Butler. And indeed, as a mode of reading, it has the potential to activate critique. If you allow an eclectic example of how reading comes into direct contact with the protocols of national intelligence and state security, we might start to understand how and why security strives to leave nothing to the imagination or interpretation. For the security analysts, the goal is to remove uncertainty and replace it with patterns and predictability. Mass amounts of data come into play, not just through the 21st century algorithm of what Shoshana Zuboff has called surveillance capitalism, but through earlier biopolitical technologies such as censuses and population protections that were all the rage in the 18th and 19th century. Not for nothing is the personal motto of General Keith Alexander, head of the NSA, quote, collect it all. The goal is total comprehension. The effort is to camp down on the conditionality of the future by ensuring certain outcomes. Security is always about reading practices. To illustrate my quirky example, document or department 17 of the CIA as imagined by James Grady in the spy thriller Six Days of the Convoy, 1974, is obviously a state intelligence agency, but its purview is culture and aesthetics. So working out of this nondescript um, location called the American Literary and Historical Society, you, see, you can see right there, American Literary and Historical Society, that's Robert Bedford, um, they, uh, these intelligence experts will keep track of all espionage and related acts in recorded in literature. So Turner, played by um, Redford here, and his colleagues read literature in order to discover potential insights about insecurity, exercising formidable interdisciplinary vigilance over scenarios and ideas that might affect Americans' feelings of stability. The conviction that cultural texts can illuminate the concept of their security in new and surprising ways deepens the belief that both academic and everyday readers of books, images, and other forms of media have much to contribute to understanding how we think and feel about security. So in the film version, 
directed by, um, well, that's that previous, directed by Sidney Pollock in 1975, uh, three, five, uh, three days of the calendar. And I just want to say, I really like this idea that when you make something for Hollywood, you have to like shorten it. So I see like all the things that we should do this to, right? Like, so we could have like a tale of a city, right? Instead of like a tale of a city. Like, I, 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 I think we need to kind of figure out what those would be. Um, so in Three Days of the Condor, uh, Turner puzzles the security who cannot figure out how a low-level analyst with few tactical skills manages to evade attempts at assassination. Turner's modest self-assessment offers no insight um, either. He said at one point, I'm not a field agent. I just read books. Well, it turns out that reading books is an underappreciated skill for understanding security and intelligence. Let me just play this short clip here. Or not? Oh wait, do we have? No. Do I? Mm -hmm. Much more. Much more. Okay, you know what? It's going to make me do so many double factor things. I'm just going to skip over this. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, we'll just go back to it. Sorry. I, 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 I guess I was doing it like when I told you that I thought it would work. But I'm just going to read the dialogue, although they would do it much better than I would. Okay? So it's like this. I'm trying to figure out how Robert Redford keeps um, evading uh, uh, capture. And they ask, and John Housen says, John has really wonderful voice. He says, Where did he learn evasive moves? The response is from the CIA a director, he reads. <laughs> then the question comes back, what in the hell does that mean? The CIA director, no, you don't understand. He reads everything. So at this point, the screenplay directs that the quote, civilian is about to protest again, but is cut off. My question, what if you weren't interrupted? Of course we can't read anything. What if the audience heard a provocation about the capacity of reading to destabilize security? How might reading create a security crisis? In what ways might reading and other forms of aesthetic activity introduce vulnerability to notions of impermeable um, sovereignty? So let me get to the second part of my talk now, which is not as long as the first, so you kind of like over white way on it's it's gonna go okay. Um, let's approach it vulnerability via its opposite, the quest for total and complete autonomy. To do so, I have to tell you about a recent trip I took to the desert. I went to Scottsdale, Arizona on a whim after reading Don Lillo's 2016 novel, Zero K, and I will have a few things to say later. But the visit turned out to be something of a pilgrimage to the site of a Futurist venture for ultimate human security that can stand biological decomposition, climate change, even death itself. In the outskirts of Phoenix is a nondescript industrial park, and there sits a low slung building that is home to Alcor Life Extension Foundation. <laughs> okay. Housing 222 human patients and over 100 animals. Alcor is the only designated nonprofit cryonic facility in the U.S. Now, rumor advice I've heard about a certain site in Clanton, Santa Clarita, there's a possibility of another cryonic facility, but maybe even we are very few, but we won't talk about that. Um, and specially designed aluminum containers cooled by liquid nitrogen that reached a negative 196 degrees. 
Okay, 196 is in this, but that's interesting too. Our clients here of Alcor await a future when legal death can be reversed and biological life revived. According to its CEO, Alcor is a pioneer, quote, in the reduction of molecular activity using ultra cold technology, unquote. In economic terms, the price of freezing one's entire body is $220,000. But there's a discount for freezing the head and brain stem alone for $90,000. In philosophical terms, the price of cryo preservation is conceptual, an explicit challenge to notions of legal death and the chronopolitics of life itself. As the CEO told me, cryonics represent an effort to, quote, maintain sovereignty over ourselves at the time of death. And it's like, I thought I could have paid you to say that, right? But this is so wonderful. So, so Alcor's technology and storage facility are all engineered in the service of an unassailable sovereignty and the invulnerability that surpasses temporally finite notions of independence. Like all human beings on this warring planet, we've grown increasingly susceptible to ecosystems breaking down uh, species extinction in extreme weather. As Ian Balcom writes in History Four Degrees Celsius, quote, the challenge of freedom from exposure to conditions of extreme vulnerability that climate change produces, unquote, leads to a reactive position that ignores any recognition of structural breakdown in favor of freedom as personal choice and individual autonomy. This immunity is emblematized by these aluminum capsules cooled by liquid nitrogen. The guide and outward encourage our tour group to place our hands on the cylinders um, to show us that the metal was not cold at all, that there'd be no different than the comfortable uh, temperature of the warehouse itself. And it's only after I took this um, picture did I see that I had captured my own reflection in the uh, aluminum cylinder. And I thought that that's um, a particularly apt image for technology that takes the external world and kind of um, projects it back on itself so that the inside of the cryonic chamber can remain uh, immune. The frozen environment here is completely sealed off from external input. The impermeability of the system, like the subjects whose brains and bodies and archives, or might we say curates, right, um, becomes still more remarkable when you consider the climatological factors outside the container. In 2020, Phoenix experienced 145 days over 100 degrees. In 2021, it broke the record for the number of consecutive days over 115 degrees, six. And in 2023, it suffered a total of 15 days over 115 degrees. None of that matters inside the alcohol facility, or more specifically, none of that matters inside the cryo tube, which requires no electricity, where the climate is continuously monitored and maintained by the nitrogen. Uh, um, stasis protects this, quote, core notion of sovereignty. In the words of Alcor's representative, down to this cellular level, the steam that you see rising from this cylinder here um, is actually uh, nitrogen gas coming from a capsule that is being capped off as a new patient is being enrolled, uh, matriculated <laughs> on this day. Um, liquid nitrogen dissipates. And the chambers each lose 15 liters of nitrogen a day to evaporation. But Alcor, our guy said, has enough supply on hand to last months before any thawing would occur. The individual quote is the individual quote is now protected from deterioration for theoretically thousands of years, unquote. And a different theoretical register also contains an invulnerable sovereignty that can last. If not for millennia, then at least as long as liquid nitrogen levels remain stable. Unafflicted by the thick heat of the Sonoran Desert, immune to climate change, each cryo citizen resides in an Arctic environment that is so completely controlled that literally nothing happens. No deterioration, no decay, no change. A discourse on sovereignty and uh, vulnerability may be a lot to rest from the techno fantasies of suspended animation. Yet this notion of the static citizen 
insulated by what Jacques Derrida calls the, quote, self-protection of the unscathed, unquote, represents the quintessence of the long-running project of liberalism to secure complete independence through the market. Its American iterations have been around for a while. Popular mythologies of Emersonian self-reliance, Herobian isolation, Raven-like Teflon, Jason Bourne self-representation, and so on. These and other fantasies of sovereignty, according to Callum and Ingram, require the self to, quote, expel the structural forces that constantly encroach on our lives and dignity, unquote. For Ingram, Sovereignty is not so much about rights or obligations, but about an affect. Quote, people cannot allow themselves to feel structure, because such a feeling risks harming their sense of self, unquote. He continues, by numbing us to the complex structural conditions that make life miserable, assertions of sovereignty offset the diminishment we feel when confronting racial injustice, economic inequality, or other systemic problems that individuals on their own seem powerless to attain change. The result is that people come to view, quote, appeals to address structural oppression as personal impositions, unquote, which guarantees nothing so much as complacency. And here's um, Ingram one last time, quote, people are complacent in a world full of obvious injustices, unquote, because their need for independence and autonomy would otherwise be compromised if not negated altogether by the crushing weight of the world's problems. Complacency might not go far enough, however. Disavowal and disassociation underwrite the effective technology and philosophy of frozen selfhood on a burning planet. Water scarcity, scorching temperatures, and the loss of habitat and biodiversity, and soil erosion may be plaguing the American Southwest, but inside the capsule it's going to be minus 196 degrees. In Zero K, a novel described as postmodern science fiction, DeLillo describes this frozen existence as a, quote, separation. The tech billionaires, finance moguls, and other believers who visit the cryo facility called the Convergence of the novel declare, quote, this is what we want. This is what we want. We have what is needed, durable energy sources and strong mechanized systems blast walls and fortified walls, structural redundancy, fire safety, security controls, land and air, elaborate cyber defense. And here I have written below this, just this Greek word, like parataxis, which is basically what's going on here. It's this clipped phrasing. Um, each little phrase here is an example of parataxis. It expresses to some extent, I think it achieves this desire. Each sentence is not a sentence, right? It t sentences usually could fire things like verbs and predicates, right? But instead, each sentence seems to exist on its own, almost self-sufficient, much like this fictional cryo utopia does, its isolation secured by the protections that spit a citadel of techno-medievalism. No surprise then that cryo technology is often militarized. Alcor employs rapid response teams of former Navy SEALs trained in medical evacuation and administering anticoagulants to prevent blood clots and cellular breakdown. Blood is then replaced with a cryoprotected solution as the body is cooled. In this scenario, every second counts not to save life, but to preserve it for the great defrosting at some future date. On the day I visited, facility had just finished the intake and cooling of a human and cat. Um, our guides gestured to a room that we could not enter. Is this the room uh, where the patient is being prepared for, st for stasis, I asked? No, but it is a room where, quote, the Chinese are trying to get in. This puzzled me. The CEO explained that Alcor is developing battlefield technology for the US military that can be used to quickly cool a body that has suffered severe trauma. Not quite flash freezing, um, since, sorry, I lost my thought. Yeah, yeah, I'm not sure. I think it was like smack this with my hand or something. But I feel like okay. But maybe, um, so like when they take these bodies of them, oh sure, thanks. So not quite flash freezing as the formation of uh, ice crystals, crystals of the blood and destroy cellular walls 
Such life-extending technology offers the military new tactics for responding to the risk that soldiers face. In the end, however, injured soldiers on a future and futuristic battlefield are a little different from the archetypal soldier that I invoked earlier, Achilles, whose invulnerability has the paradoxical effect of heightening his singular vulnerability. Whether it is his literal heel or the symbol of human susceptibility to mortality that we all share, the realization of weakness for both, the active assertions of autonomy, doubling down on self-enclosure that encompasses both the futuristic technologies of life extension and older technologies of sovereignty. No wonder that Achilles reifies rage itself. His infamous anger simmers over the fact that masculine prowess and mastery never can fully eradicate all the vulnerability, revealing that claims of sovereignty themselves originate from the insecurity of human exposed. Not complacency, as Ingram might have it, but aggression, an effective state institutionalized by the military, more um, accurately underwrites the separation and walling off. Judith Butler places such antagonism in larger context as a response to the lost innocence following the attacks of September 11. U.S. citizens had, come, had to come to grips with the fact that, quote, the national border was more permeable than we thought, she writes, fueling the public sphere consumed, quote, by anxiety, rage, a radical desire for security, unquote. But because of we've seen that desire is always done by its other, security dependent on insecurity, vulnerability emerging from invulnerability, the impossibility of fulfilling the desire that produces a doubling down and intensification than described. We might wonder, however, as Butler does, whether, quote, experiences of vulnerability and loss have to lead straight away to military violence and retribution, unquote. What would it mean instead to accept that no security measures will foreclose such dependency? For Butler, quote, the recognition that radical forms of self-sufficiency and unbridled sovereignty are, by definition, disrupted by larger global processes, unquote, such as climate change or the precarities of new neoliberalism, might enable us to relinquish fantasies of security and autonomy. In their place, we might commit to, quote, reimagining the possibility of community on the basis of vulnerability and loss, she writes in Precarious Life. In the volume entitled Vulnerability and Resistance, she extends this examination to consider how public protests and other acts of resistance help create coalitions and collectivities that counter state authoritarianism. Instead of the aggressive defensive defense or self-enclosure of national borders, the experience of vulnerability reaches out toward a modified notion of sovereignty characterized by, quote, permeability and receptiveness. Writing about the 2013 Occupy Gezi moment in Turkey, Zeynep Gembeni explores how the space of appearance, a component of the polos described by Hannah Arendt, necessitates a type of exposure that comes with being in public, requiring that a person, quote, move out of one's shelter, step out into the open, and unprotected state, unquote. Such actions have the potential to free sovereignty from its over-reliance on security, motivating the sorts of questions that the Hoover Act asked. He writes, quote, what about a sovereignty of the vulnerable? A sovereignty that would not be opposed to vulnerability, a vulnerable sovereignty. But is such a thing possible? Unquote. Not only might such insecure security, such compromised autonomy, such impermeable permeability, such incomplete sovereignty be possible, it may be an inevitable consequence of the doubling down of this project. Two quick examples help sketch this vulnerability. The first brings us back to Alcor life extension one last time. A gender split is a pronounced uh, in the makeup of its clientele, roughly 80-20 in favor of men. The CEO explained that many opting for cryopreservation worked in the tech industry and had devoted their lives to the advancement of science and technology. This commitment, he said, went on, often entailed a solitary, even monastic lifestyle. For these men who have no partner, no children, or other close family, the, quote, idea of having a team that cares for them, unquote, after, or better yet, in death, can seem comforting and reassuring. 
The very contingencies that the process requires, from the custodial act of topping off liquid nitrogen each month, to the need to ensure a stable energy source for, for centuries, reveal that sovereignty needs a host of others to maintain and serve it, service it. After all, as princes and nations have long known, sovereignty has always required an army. Now to my second and last example. The cryo facility in Don Below Zero K functions as its own independent city-state. Its isolation and design safeguards billionaire benefactors who choose a premature death so that they can live, as it were, quote, completely outside the narrative of what we refer to as history. We are pledged to an inwardness, a deep probing focus on who and where we are. You are about to become, each of you, a single life in touch with only yourself. Unquote. If history is what hurts, as Frederick Janus's uh, famous epigram has it, then the life that is frozen solid offers immunity to historical change driven by forces as global and relentless as capitalism and climate. As the facility's resident guru envisions, quote, those who eventually emerge from the capsules will be ahistorical humans. <coughs> Unquote. Billionaires seem to have it all figured out, achieving the desire expressed in the novel's first sentence, quote, everyone wants to own the end of the world. The narrator thus cleverly notes that in this cryopolis, quote, the bodies are banked and waiting. All contingencies may be anticipated, but what's not foreseen is the existential vulnerability of being left alone with an inwardness so severe and total that a, quote, single life in touch with only itself, unquote, consumes itself. The novel hinges upon an experimental mill. Um, I'm sorry I can't read this well enough, but I'll go with some of it. In which readers experience the anguished thought process of what it's like being stuck in a cryo tube. At first, there is boredom. Quote, does it keep going on like this? The specimen wonders. Next, there's a contraction of, quote, being drawn into the grim limits of self, unquote, with no possible outside or resting. This intense concentration of self produces an existential hurt that fragments into shards of consciousness forever split between self and its sameness that has now become irrevocably other. Eternal monologue transmogrifies into a nightmare, that's the rules of words, a nightmare dialogue. Ultimately, language fails itself, leaving existence without the capacity of reference. Quote, am I someone? Or is it just words themselves that make me think I'm someone? Are the words themselves all there is? Am I just the words? Unquote, that is signs unmoored and signifies. Unable to refer to anything, the self lacks any reference points for selfhood. This may be the true horror. Not that the self no longer exists, but that it goes on and on without meaning or referentiality. The inexpressible horror is a sovereignty vulnerable to nothing other than itself. Okay, I get that it would be kind of depressing to end here. So let me wrap up by mentioning a final complication, one that may be not inappropriate for an institute of the arts. The consciousness trapped inside the capsule belongs to the narrator's stepmother, and her name is Artis, A-R-T-I-S. Clearly, the little wants us to take the next step and turn the name into a noun. Artis become artist, A-R-T-I-S-T. -T. The cryo facility represents not so much a state of the art lab, but a contemporary art installation with sculptures, experimental film, and performance pieces. Screens drop from the ceiling to project the scenes of people fleeing, war and destruction only to be replaced by performance pieces of real runners through the corridors. Most aesthetic of all are the bodies, quote, the chirogenic dead, upright in their capsules. This was art in itself, nowhere else but here, unquote. There's more. The last words of the narrator's father before he undergoes premature surgical death are, quote, gesso on linen, unquote. Perhaps a reference to the Rothko like paintings in his Manhattan townhouse. Cultural institutions like museums are dedicated to art preservation. How does this charge compare with the mission of the convergence to freeze and protect bodies as though they were artworks? Defenses of the humanities and the arts claim that art and literature uh, are things 
that have value because they increase empathy. Art makes us vulnerable, as Marianne Hirsch writes. Quote, aesthetic and, uh, encounters elicit a sense of vulnerability that can move us towards the ethics and the politics of open-endedness and mobility. In our acts of reading, looking, and listening, we necessarily allow ourselves to be vulnerable as we practice openness, interconnection, and imagination. Unquote. I agree with the sentiment, but it gives me pause. The art as empathy bar gets trotted out as an alternative knowledge resource or skill in debates that would evaluate humanities and arts in terms of their utility. Commentators often try to square the circle by insisting that empathy and open-mindedness themselves have value in the economy and culture at large. Just because this line of defense sounds familiar doesn't make it any less true. Why my dissatisfaction? Well, perhaps the me stems from knowing that conversations about aesthetics and vulnerability, about the ability of art to entice us to see beyond sovereignty, need to do more than settle on familiarity and intelligibility. Thanks. Uh, all right, thanks so much for that. Yeah. We have uh, time for conversation. Anyone who wants to open up a uh, question? Uh, all right, thanks so much for that. Yeah. We have uh, time for conversation. Anyone who wants to open up a uh, question? Comment? Hmm? Request for clarification? You know how these things go. Yeah, you know, I can just uh, open up. Uh, just going back to the, uh, just to say something. It really reminded me also of uh, basically of fascism. Um, the idea of always, um, like, um, um, basically, how do you say it in English? Um, uh, like, wh when we just, uh, for example, if you, if you see something uh, at your neighbor's house, tell it to be all purposes. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's interesting that um, we have examples of how it happened in the impression on you know, in any uh, of our intellectual regimes, but it's now it's everywhere, it's everywhere now in, in the metros, in the streets. Um, we're just like, yeah, it's part of democracy, it's part of liberalism, it's just my mom, we should think about security. So it's interesting to me just to think about security now. But yeah, but there is a kind of, um, it has been changed into something that is positive, it is something that we should look out for, while historically speaking, it has also been used um, <coughs> basically against the people themselves. Right, I mean, it's, it's right, this now that it's, and it's not so critical, it's done to protect us, right? Right, I think the thing is, is that, and even now, right, this, the, that slide is about protecting democracy, right? Mm -hmm. And I think the more inventive thing that we have to try to figure out is, well, how can we democratize protection? Mm -hmm. Right. That's you know we've got our antecedents and and and, and predicates all mess, that mix up. So yeah, yeah I, I mean I, I think it's a really important observation. Thank you. Yeah, I had a similar thought with the pictures of so if you see something say something, and that is in both pictures there's either the viewer is the presumptive person who would be saying something or the the one on the right. Uh, the woman in the picture was presumably the person who was seeing something. And in both cases, there was nobody else around. So to me, what was weird was, it wasn't like you were reporting to help anybody else, you were reporting to help yourself. Mm -hmm. And That's good. what that sort of um, got me thinking about is, uh, in terms of things like animal behavior, you can either be risk averse, you could be a time minimizer or an energy maximizer. Why has government, presumably the people put the signs up, um, trying to push people towards the risk averse instead of the other possible things that would guide behavior? And I'm just wondering, like, is that part of the conversation? Is it that risk is the thing that is controllable? But the other factors were kind of at a point in technology that uh, time and resources are, they're not infinite, but they're less malleable. I think they also thinking about like, risk is really profitable. Right? I mean, risk is about, you know, just uh, you, wanna, you can bet on risk, right? You know, that's how the market works. And so I think that 
in strange way, this is like this is, you know, this is like a, 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 a society structured by the military police that's kind of betting on itself, right? And, and kind of mortgaging like the future that we should all have for the purposes of a certain type of continuance. And I say about mortgaging the future that we all have, what I mean by that is that all these things are about calculating the number of possibilities, right? So that tends to actually almost like rob us of a future tense, right? Because we're trying to like, you know, not have a, like, a, you know, a, 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 a you know that woman with the phone is looking out, like who knows what she's seeing in that social world, right? Maybe it's like kids on a mirror ground, right? Maybe it's probably like a park or something like that. But that's like all to be controlled, you know, brought within the, um, within those patterns. So I think that risk is like, is, uh, it's like a really wonderful way of controlling. The other things that you're talking about, I mean, I don't know, it, it, it's a hard to know if they have as much the kind of biopolitical energy behind it. Like you're talking about like um, like resources, right? Like what if we gave, you know, uh, people, what if people were given like a, a guaranteed income, right? And like what would that do to crime? Things like that, but that's like just not like, it's just not as profitable, you know? And so I think there's, it's, it's really about a type of profit and also which allows for a certain type of maximization of tracking and, and controlling and you know you get biographical data and all that stuff for that. So I think my answer, I think those are good observations. I guess I'm just thinking that time and resources are also profitable. I think risk is more manipulatable. Mm -hmm. And that if you it's easier to control risk. I don't know that it's the profit per se, it's the ability to alter the perception of risk. Right. Right, and that's you know just to go back to what I, I think that's right. That's why I'm really interested in this as like a, a, a you know a, like a project about feelings and how we feel rather than you know I, I mean there are plenty of people who have done uh, you know you can read scores of books about um, you know the, the security state and, and, and contemporary surveillance. And the great thing about them is you read them like the ones from like 2010. The numbers are so wildly out of date. I mean it's just like wrapped up, but, but, but that's only telling that same story about spending, and, and, and I think there's something else about that. You know, ultimately, ultimately, at some level, somewhere we consent, right, to this, I think. You know, and, and it would be interesting to kind of figure out where that consent happens and, and, and where we relinquish you know, certain types of, 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 of having to say. You know, it's just the, um, just like Hobbes uses, um, uh, uses this formula, and, and I won't do the Latin, but he says, it's in Latin, he says, uh, he says I protect, therefore I oblige, right? Um, and what would it mean to like, you know, reverse that for the state, where it's like, hey, we're obliging the state, now it needs to protect us, whether it's through, you know, food security, minimum wage, all these things. So I think it's like trying to reverse ways that we have thought itself. I saw your hand first, and then I'll come with you. Yeah, one of the things that when you're talking, one is, um, other, do you women really remember receiving an email um, yeah. survey about security? I hope you're all going to say yes. I've given what in other institutions where I've seen that, and I wrote back in my book, this is, this had no impact at all on the number of deaths or anything. This is a bit like the Volvo. Scenario of people thinking that they're involved with the Volvo and they have more fashion, or the, the street furniture, which was going around in London, where they took away all sorts of signs and street furniture to behave. The, the number of, of um, casualties in roads went down because people were like, you know, cautiously because they weren't surrounded by paraphernalia telling them, you know, just, just stop, 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 you know. And, and but as you said, there's no that that you can manufacture this, you can sell this, you can. You can it's, it's a product that goes on, I mean, it's a, it's a concept that goes on really. Um, what, um, I'm wondering if you've looked at bunkers, I'm just thinking of the film, Jenny Berlin's one called Bunker, which is the same, which is the same notion of selling, selling, selling an absence, an absence, selling security is the absence of, the absence of feeling in those cases. It's kind of going to, it's not after death, but it's, it's a kind of prolonged death, it's the, these, these bunkers which exist, Especially or in the you know, in um, survivors of the right. and they and they're people who go into more and more kind of myopic, you know, trying to trying to yeah, work out ways in which they will survive and what they're what they're running from becomes more and more abstract or what they're what they're what the threat is apart from 
the egg becomes more and more abstract. So it's, what, it's the same, there seems to be the, the, the constant push towards the presence and the absence. The presence of something which makes you feel secure, get security in an absence of event, the wrong way to find the event. Right? Um, and so, you know, the, the, the absence of the game should never be fixed to the game. The game makes you feel the other presence of something. That's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I, just on that. No, I very much appreciate that. I have to say that um, one thing you should know about the security cameras on campus. I was doing college tours with my daughter in the UK, and, and there's one of the selling points was this is the most surveilled campus <laughs> in the United States, and it has more security cameras than any other campus. And they're like, you know, just pound it out. So you guys have a long way to go. <laughs> um, so bunkers, right? Safe rooms. Um, there was a film with Jody Foster and young Kristen Stewart. There's um, The Road, right? Cormac McCarthy, they spent time in a bunker. Um, there's also the 1950s when people were building bunkers in their backyards with the year of the global government and nuclear war, right? All these things are right. But what's really interesting in what you said is that you used the word abstract. I thought that was really cool. You saw all these dangers of becoming abstract. And not only that, you become almost kind of like literary, I would say, like with the zombie, you know, which is like we will also do this. I think that's important, though. And this is, you know, as it becomes more and more indefined. Mm -hmm. The air itself. Right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Which is what happened in COVID, isn't it? Every, you know, the air becomes, you know, threatened. So we certainly didn't know that there was going to be such a thing. And that was a kind of National fear, whereas the risk is being quantified and managed and so on and so on and profited from and used. And why this is interesting, just in the seminar I was in today, we were reading this short piece of fiction by Melville, and he said it was like, man, um, man trying to avoid man, that's, and, and to him, that's like the height of the type of thing that you're talking about, that we lose the sociality, right? The, 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 um, the, the grist that kind of allows us to relate. And that's what I was thinking about that woman in the crowd of It's like, you know, she's, she's lost any sort of connection. And then she's like left with herself. And that's like the scariest thing at all. You should have another question. Yeah, go ahead. So, like, how do you democratize protection without falling into fascism? Uh, because it's like, mm -hmm. I think that's like Koshman's whole thing where he's like, you know, the most democratic society is actually a fascist society. And I agree, I agree with him. And so I'm like, so my thing, hopefully, I'm like, how how do you have not like, the, how do you have the right kind of paranoia in society? <laughs> and, and so I'm like, my, I'm more sympathetic towards like a sacrificial politics, like sacrifice the idea of the need of protection. Altogether. Altogether. Uh -huh. That's interesting. I mean, and that, you know, my point was this is like, if you do that, then you lose the possibility of art. You know, that, 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 that's hops. So like, if, you don't, if you're so worried about, you know, being attacked, you're not able to get a chance to, like, paint. Social contract theory saves art, anyway, or makes it possible for people to Right. But, yeah. But, I, mean, I think you can actually have art flourish. It's, like, it's not like sacrificing, it's not like you won't be protected. It's just like sacrificing the sovereignty to, like, the higher powers. They have to right. like, uh, I don't know. I mean, I think it's, you know, I mean, I think, the question you're posing is a good one. I'm not going to answer. But I'm going to say, what if we brought into the conversation things like the welfare state? Yeah. Right? We, you know, that would be an interesting thing. What if we brought in things like I mean, what examples of collectivism are there? You know, what, what, what about like trade unionism? I think those are things that we could think about how they might enter that conversation, right? Um, and it seems to me that, you know, artists for once have been, uh, some of them are completely. Completely narcissistic, whatever. But some are really good at forming collectives, you know, and sharing resources and ideas. So I think it would be interesting to bring those ideas into the conversation around protection. So you could imagine protection coming from other families, right? Um, and, to, and and also to have, you know, the thing is that we don't have a conversation about it anymore. Right? This is this is like you know, so it's, we've always already consented. Yeah. You know, and, that, and that's that's the problem. So that's why you know this is kind of an effort. Like I'm not a social planner, thank God for all of you. But um, <laughs> we're doing good. I think you're really good at it. Stuff. 
the thing about it is like, I'm not a social analyst, but this is kind of an effort in thinking. You know, like what, and it's not thinking what we know, we're trying to think about what we don't know, things that we have declared, you know, are, are, are camp or flight, you know, things like that. And maybe there's something there is it that conversations about it. It's like you can't even have, you know, like conversations about your reality. Meanwhile, or, you know, I won't go into where our reality is. I'll ask you a question about aesthetics, if I may. Yeah. I was really interested in you were reading uh, these pages, or you're quoting from these pages, which are pages from a novel that appear to us kind of like poetry. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's why I put it Looking right at there. these lines, so <laughs> I was thinking of our colleagues in the writing uh, program as well. And they kind of took me back to the, the title of your talk and this sort of question of the aesthetics of security. Mm -hmm. um, so I was trying to think specifically about what, what might the aesthetics of security be? Do we have a name for it? What does it look like? A little bit like, you know, postmodernism is the aesthetic of late yeah. capitalism. Is there something like an aesthetic uh, of security? What might we call that? And I kind of got there um, from that early say something, see something, say something moment, because you had this sort of quite funny, imaginative moment where you're like, what would it be like? if we started saying everything that we're seeing, right? <laughs> Which is sometimes something I do sometimes to calm myself down. If there's too much anxiety, I just start enumerating everything that I'm seeing to. And effectively, it takes a paratactic form. It's a kind of list, right? Where you are, you know, chair, table, rug, wine, you know, you kind of go through things. And so parataxis maybe has a role in this kind of aesthetic. I mean, it's interesting that later when we're talking about Robert Redford and what is it, three days of the, of the Condor, that's not about saying everything, but he's reading yeah. everything, right? So that's kind of a sort of other side of that. I don't know what that would mean to read everything. We were talking before about when you have parataxis, when you have these lists, typically you don't read them. You stop at some point because yeah. they, they read very badly. I mean, of course, experimental poets write it like that, so there you're kind of required, solicited to read that. But so is parataxis the aesthetic of security because of the sheer totalizing listing that it can put out there? Uh, can we even say that? And then also had this question in the back of my mind that we never really read everything, right? You read over certain words off yeah, yeah. the, you know, so you That's skip certain things when you're reading too. So is it even possible from the, the brain point of view? I might have more to say about that to actually read everything, you know? Mm -hmm. I had this issue the other day because um, Martine and I have been in conversation about this Borges text that we talked about yesterday too where Borges actually quotes the same three lines or something from the Quixote. And they're exactly the same, he quotes them twice. But when you're reading the piece, you get the sort of impression maybe they're not the same. And so I really spent a lot of time reading them very slowly, making sure I read everything so that they're exactly the same. But normally I don't read like that. Though. It's right. the kind of security move I feel through. You know, so they're actually the same. So to go back to the main question, what might be an aesthetics of security? Would you have a name for that? And then also, what might it look like? Is it paratactic text when it comes to text? What might it look like in art? Do you have any thoughts on that? In art, mm, that's interesting. Um, you're going to answer great. This is great. I mean, I've just thought of something. You just might be scanning, right? If that's, that's the kind of yeah. mode you would you're right. scanning. Right, yeah, which is a machine equivalent. Which is a kind of a, which is a, a, a equivalence, and then so the detection can be equivalence, right? Thing that we're seeing mm -hmm. everything, scanning a room, scanning a text, right. and then focus. So it's like see something. The something is right. that you're supposed to be scanning that. What do you see here? Mm -hmm. You can scan it, you can see nothing. And I think that's the kind of tension that we have between, which is like the, is that, are you a human? Yeah. Which of these right. has got stairs? You're sort of scanning the images and right. the images. Mm -hmm. And on this computer, you don't read this as stairs. If you're scanning with the human brain, supposedly, you chat. You see stairs, so you focus, you, you distinguish, it's got the equivalence, and then you kind of focus on something. And that, I don't know what the name would be, the mode of scanning, scansion, and which is a way of talking about poetry. So, well, is it well, kind, of, the kind of uh, security maybe of an environment? You're saying that the state is invested in this, right? So, what about like, right, would you talk about the aesthetics of a census? 
I mean, that's like the, that's the listing of the population. Which right? is a list, yeah. You know, so it seems to me that you're, I, mean, it, it, I guess like a list is a type of pair of access, right? Absolutely. Yeah. You know, um, and then I always think though, back to my, um, my dissertation advisor here, I would do this, is that my, my dissertation advisor was, was Hayden White. And he wrote this really interesting article about the concept of narrativity in history. And he talks about how he's looking at these, these, um, these like yearly journals of like what's happening in, uh, that some bishop was keeping like in, in, in medieval Europe. And he'll say things like, 1343, Mongols attack. 1345. You know, Huns uh, come. You know, 1346 uh, um, floods. 1347, nothing happened. And then he, and he's showing them how this happens. And he says at the end of this, can we ever narrativize without moralizing? Right? I think that's really interesting. So I, I think even the list, what I'm wondering, what sort of narrative order is it going to take? What sort of, you know, um, uh, and that's interesting because then it becomes like, you know. If, 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 if the listing, let's just say the population is an aesthetic act, then that would be really of the state to enforce security. And that's neat. Why? Because then we can read it aesthetically. And then when we read aesthetically, we do all sorts of things. We look for ellipses, right? We look for gaps. We look for aporia. We look for irony. We look for repetitions. We look for... So I'm just thinking, like, if you know, I, so if this, there's an aesthetics of security, Maybe that holds out promise because we know that aesthetics is something that we can engage, right? That it, that aesthetics that says like to us a lot of times, interpret me, you know, feel me, experience me, listen to me, and that could be a uh, you know. So it seems to me it's like a version of that thing that I was just talking about with Hobbes, right? Where it's been saying, you know, it's not um, I protect you, therefore you reply. Just like no, no, we're reading you, we're experiencing this aesthetic form that the state has given to us, and. Now you you know you have to the state has to perform in certain ways. So you know maybe that allows for certainly not an equal two way street, but it does create the possibility for feedback loops, dialogue, commentary. You know that's what you know. I think why we're all in this aesthetic game. So, you know, do you have a form in mind besides the fair taxes and this? No, but I was thinking the first things you know. See somebody say something. I was thinking, well, there's a kind of ultimate realism in that, right? In terms of aesthetic, but I think of the list. It's not really a realist thing. I mean, there's lists all across literary history, but really, postmodernism has been associated with the list, and certainly the level is yeah, yeah. postmodern author. But you know, there is probably some sort of fascist version of realism out there that would say it all. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because, like, if you're thinking about forms and it's like, what forms? Like, I mean, you and I would say, oh, well, it certainly it has to be the sonnet. Right? We wouldn't choose like the sonnet as a form of right. security. But you know, it's interesting because I teach, um, and then, this is kind of a very associational thing. I teach these sonnets by Colin McKay, and one of them, um, and he writes these sonnets like this Alexandrian sonnets about they're like about lynching, they're about um, mob violence, right? All in fourteen lines, and one of them. The titles to the white, and then it's F I E N D S. And I can't tell you how many of my students, and I think McKay intended this, read it as to the white friends. And I have to have them go back to the title, and it's like, oh, it's to the white fiends. And I made that mistake too. I thought, you know, when I first read it. And so I'm thinking, like, this is what aesthetics has that possibility to do to us. It allows us to, you know, it, it allows us to create mistakes. So I think that's really important that we like have misreadings, that we make mistakes, because then the total fascist form of the aesthetic form that you're thinking about, you know, if it, if it is, if we can see, it doesn't even have to be intended as aesthetic, and you're talking about intention today a little bit, but if we can recognize it as aesthetic, that invites our participation. It's fun you're bringing this example, because me, I was thinking about the testimonies of Charles Reznikov, who was a a po objectivist poet, and he's been uh, wandering across the across America in the early nineteenth century. And he was he took like manuscript of trials going on at the time. I think it was uh, on the span, during the span of time of forty years. And 
out of this manuscript of transcript of trials, he did poems, but they're really short. They're like almost like three lines, and it's almost like life and death and crime mm. of one person on like three lines. And it's interesting because first there's the filter of the state, the justice system, that is summing up the story of a man. Really, and then there's a future of the poet who is kind of rephrasing, making choices, etc. It's still really like objectivist, but yeah, I feel like it's also interesting related to this aesthetic of security. And this is objective, the, the, the objective nature is that, like, so you have these, these cases of criminal justice, right? Yeah, and so. Is that inviting, what's so the objective nature of that? Is that inviting our, like, our judgment upon it? Is it? It's kind of really disturbing because obviously both crimes are horrible. It's a lot of murder, uh, murders. Um, also sometimes just like, yeah, a lot of lynching, actually, a lot of lynching. Uh, not lynching, and also, like at the same time, you're kind of it's a testimony of the banality of the evil, mm -hmm. but the fact that there are also kind of like short sum up of the life and death of a 